Since its debut in 1996 on the original PlayStation, the Resident Evil franchise has made itself known throughout the world. Coming to pretty much define the genre of survival horror, and then throw it in the bin for some occasions, this franchise has certainly had its ups and downs. So 25 years later, and over 25 games, let's have a look and rank them all, shall we? I'm Ben Roy from Whatcoach.com, and this is every Resident Evil game ranked from worst to best. Number 30, Resident Evil Umbrella Corps. Starting off with the lowest of the lows, Umbrella Corps is, well, shovelware at this point. It really does feel like someone took a load of assets from Capcom, mulled them up together and just made some online mess. This game released within the dark times between Resident Evil 6 and 7 where we didn't know what was up next for the franchise and things look grim. There was Revelations 2 around that time, but still, Umbrella Corpse was nothing to shout home about. Now it was nice seeing some locations in nice glorious HD or later 4K, but that's all. It belongs in the same camp as Metal Gear Survive or even Fallout 76. You you know that place where beloved franchises go to die. Number 29, Resident Evil 2, Game.com. Now this is a weird one and pretty much a port, but why not include it anyway, hey? A 2D rendition of Resident Evil 2, you take on the role of Leon S. Kennedy, and we don't play as Claire at all in this one. This is the leanest version of Resident Evil 2 out there. No cutscenes, no story. I wouldn't really even say this one is for the true diehards. Just seek out any other version of Resident Evil 2 and you'll be more satisfied. Most people don't even know this exists. Number 28, Resident Evil Reverse Beta. Now yes, this is a beta and don't attack me for this, but I'm determined to get every Resident Evil game on this list of any consequence. So, reverse beta it is because the game's delayed till around July-ish. That being said, this game is horribly unbalanced, looks awfully weird, and makes the RCPD feel bloated. Another neat idea and concept, but this mishmash of famous Resident Evil characters just doesn't work. Seriously, if you don't have an automatic weapon, you're done for. Number 27, Resident Evil Resistance. Now, yes, you can't buy this without Resident Evil 3, but it's got its own trophy list and it's own executable, so we should at least recognize it for being its own game. That being said, this is Capcom just giving multiplayer another go and throwing things at the wall. See if they stick. Sure, asymmetric multiplayer is a better option than, you know, third person team based combat games. It feels a bit half baked, clunky and after a few games, you've kind of got the gist. But after the length of Resident Evil 3, Resistance just left a bad taste in players mouths. Number 26. Resident Evil Survivor. Now for most people on the internet these days, they won't realize that this was the debut of Resident Evil in first person. Yes, way back on the PS1. Trying to expand the series out into other genres was novel at the time, but it didn't land and didn't help that the PS1's control wasn't up for it. And this being the first spin-off, it didn't really permit it to canon. You played as an amnesiac pilot battling his way through an umbrella facility after Raccoon City was destroyed. Unfortunately, it didn't end up too well and wasn't reviewed highly either. Just look at other first person shooters of the time. With a weak story, terrible graphics and horrible controls, this one's been left to die. Number 25. Resident Evil Survivor 2 Code Veronica Releasing one year after the first game, Survivor 2 was a slight improvement on the first. This was a kind of rerun of Code Veronica and placed players as Claire Redfield again, but this time in first person. And yes, sometimes you was playing as Stevie, so there's that. Arcade mode sees the two racing to escape Rockford Island, whilst dungeon mode is more of an early horde based system. And in an effort to mix things up, this second Resident Evil FPS saw Nemesis turn up, you know, in Veronica, really destroying canon. On top of that the box art was pretty terrifying. Young me was scared of this one. Despite adding some new bells and whistles and throwing in Nemesis, this one doesn't stand the test of time. Number 24, Resident Evil Dead Aim. Dropping the Survivor label, they were hoping we didn't notice this was a continuation, though Dead Aim was really the end of this experiment. And after this, Capcom wouldn't go back to first person for four years. Saying that, this one took place four years after the Raccoon City incident on an Umbrella cruise ship called Spencer Rain, which of course is infested with the T-Virus. But thanks to alternating between first and third person action, Dead Aim felt more engaging and free flowing, and it also stood out for telling an original story. When it released, it was the best first person Resident Evil out there, a title some would argue it held until Resident Evil 7. That being said, its reviews were still aggressively mediocre, and thus, just like the other two Resident Evil first person shooters, it fell into obscurity. It also didn't help that it came out the same year as Resident Evil Remake and Zero. That year was stacked for RE games. Number 23, Resident Evil Gaiden. 
following in the footsteps of Metal Gear Ghost Babble, Resident Evil Garden was the first in the series to jump onto Game Boy. Distancing itself from the main story and taking place on another cruise ship, former Stars operative Barry Burton was sent in to investigate a disturbance, whilst also tracking down a missing Leon S. Kennedy. Taking place mainly in a top-down perspective, Gaiden would swap to first person now and then. For a weird combat situations where it looked like you were playing a golf game, try as it might, Gaiden didn't manage to match the other qualities of other portable games, and yet again became another mediocre Resident Evil spin-off, but this time on the Game Boy Color. It was a neat idea and it was fun to have Resident Evil on the go, but Barry Burton deserved better. Number 22, Resident Evil The Mercenaries 3D. Thanks to being on the 3DS, this game allowed players to take Resident Evil Mercenaries on the go and was a hybrid of content from Resident Evil 4 and 5. This game is also notable as it was the first to get Capcom's MT Framework engine running on a portable system. Despite the limitations of handhelds at the time, The Mercenaries 3D was mildly entertaining. Once you've unlocked all the modes and characters, there isn't really anything else to do. Sure, you can chase those high scores, but after a while, that gets saming. The fact it included a demo for Resident Evil Revelations spoke volumes. So a bit like when people bought Crackdown back in the day for Halo 3, Resident Evil fans were keen to get their hands on this one. If not, just to get a taste of a new Resident Evil game down the line. Number 21, Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. Clearly inspired by Left 4 Dead and other co-op shooters, Operation Raccoon City was an action-focused romp. Playing as one of 12 different operatives, it was up to you and three of your buddies to fight through Raccoon City, blasting through infected hordes, and a obtaining evidence behind the scenes. Expanding the demise of the city had some potential. After all, wasn't that what the fourth survivor did in RE2? Hunk sure generated some buzz in the early years. And weirdly enough, this spin-off generated 3.2 million units sold. Between this and Resident Evil 6, the franchise was in a rough place in 2012. Well, if you're a fan of survival horror, to this day, making Resident Evil multiplayer has always been tricky. Though that's not stopped Capcom trying this over and over again. Number 20, Resident Evil Deadly Silence. When the DS first released back in 2004, of course there was a gold rush to get older titles on this machine. You know, to cash in twice. After Resident Evil Garden struggled to get any attention, really, Capcom also went back to the well. Resident Evil Deadly Silence brought a slew of new additions. Rebirth mode, reworked enemy placements, first person knife sequences made use of the DS stylus, and several multiplayer modes allowed for quick and easy matches over LAN. Back in 2004, managing to get the original Resident Evil running on a port system was impressive, though these days you could just get it running on a phone. At least back then Capcom made a real effort to get a top tier version you could play anywhere, so we can kind of forgive some of the limitations, such as dodgy sound for instance. With the far superior Resident Evil remake having released four years earlier, this is just a nice addition. Number 19, Resident Evil Outbreak. Now Resident Evil and multiplayer don't really go together, like chalk and cheese, but with Resident Evil Outbreak, something clicked. Perhaps because it kept the original gameplay and went for the old style and wasn't some arcade shooter. In this one, players were cast as Raccoon City survivors, trying to escape the T-Virus zombies. They all had varied skills which forced players to work together as the clock was ticking. To really step up the survival horror aspect, there was a permadeath system added, which deleted players' save files if they died. But by far the creepiest aspect of the game was seeing a player pass on and become a zombie themselves. Sadly, lack of voice chat really hurt this one. Online gaming just wasn't there yet. This one was really ahead of its time and forced most to play this single player, me included. Sure, this and Case Files 2 didn't sell that well, but if Capcom went back to it now, it'd surely be a hit, rather than just cranking out some online games to go with Resident Evil 3 and 8. Number 18. Resident Evil Outbreak File 2 Ah, remember the days of the expansion? Before DLC was the coined term? Well, back then, we got one on the PlayStation 2. Outbreak Files 2 added more scenarios and really mixed up some of the gameplay. Wild Things saw you go through an infested zoo, and Underbelly saw you going through the subway, fighting a giant mutated flea boss. The most prominent story and one fans will remember was Desperate Times, which reveals the backstory of Raccoon City police officer Marvin, and how he got infected in the events of Resident Evil 2. With its more oddball scenarios and improved multiplayer, Outbreak Files 2 was the most ambitious multiplayer game Capcom had gone for at this point. And despite the service being shut off, fans brought this one back to life in 2014. Number 17. Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles Now if there's one thing the Wii did for home gaming, it was making light gun games accessible outside the arcade. Now games like House of the Dead could be played at home with ease, rather than fiddling around with third party controllers and getting them to work. 
So in 2007, Umbrella Chronicles retold the stories of Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil 3, but this time in an arcade shooter style. Playing as all the major characters and allowing a friend to tag along, this one was a bunch of fun, and even sold 1.4 million units on Nintendo's hardware. But what the real selling point here for most fans was playing as Wesker, finding out how he got out of the mansion, and following his devious plans after that. On top of this, Umbrella Chronicles worked to fill in some of the other gaps, following Jill and Chris as they sought to fight Umbrella once more. Sure, this was on rails, but it was a great addition to the franchise and a nice bit of extra lore. Number 16. Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles Two years after Umbrella Chronicles and with Resident Evil 5 having been released, The Dark Side Chronicles picked up where previous games left off homing in on scenarios that took place just before the fifth entry. The most notable, of course, was following Leon S. Kennedy and Jack Krauser as they went through South America, giving us an insight to how that relationship fell apart. More importantly, Darkseid expanded on Umbrella by adding a dynamic difficulty system and online leaderboards. Darkseid Chronicles stepped up in almost every way and took players deeper into Resident Evil lore, whilst also creating new spins on Resident Evil 2 and Code Veronica. This one boasted a bunch of improvements and, well, was just a solid follow-up. Number 15. Resident Evil 6. Now we need to talk about the weakest in the mainline franchise, don't we? Despite selling a ton, it's so sad to see a franchise drift so far from its roots. Thanks to Resident Evil 4, the games had been getting increasingly more action oriented throughout the years, and Resident Evil 6 was arguably the most ambitious of the lot. This was kind of a Resident Evil Infinity War slash Endgame event, with six protagonists across three different interweaving campaigns. And if that wasn't enough, there was a secret fourth campaign with the legendary Ada Wong. That being said, it's kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet. After too much you're just exhausted and want this thing to end. Enemies don't flinch towards bullets anymore and it's just a mindless shooter fest. Each of the three campaigns also has its different twist, with Leon's trying to harken back to the good old days, you know of survival horror. Chris is being extremely action focused, but with no boulder punching. And the third main one was Jake's, but at least it was nice to see Sherry again. Capcom went a bit too far with this one and it was kind of a clusterfuck. I'm sorry. Captain. Number 14, Resident Evil Revelations 2. The second in the spin-off series, this one slots quite nicely into canon. Revelations 2 is a massive departure from the Nintendo DS exclusive series. The sub-series was meant to be played in short bursts, but it wasn't long before Revelations found its way to home consoles. Weirdly enough, Revelations 2 was split into chunks once again, even though it was all finished before the first episode launched. Later down the line, you can just play it all at once, and that's probably the best way to do it. Though unlike Revelations 1, Revelations 2 takes a saw spin. Support Claire Redfield is pulled back in for a third time. But this time it isn't just a random soldier. No, this is Alex Wesker who's the main antagonist here, the only other survivor of Project W. Along with bringing Barry Burton back into the fold and introducing his daughter, this one has some stakes. Barry and Claire play differently to Moira and Natalia, whereas they shoot guns and punch anyone in the face. Moira doesn't like guns and will normally stick to her flashlight. Natalia, on the other hand, is a small child and can't fight towering monsters, but has the unique ability to see them through the walls. So unlike Resident Evil 5 and 6, Player 2 isn't a carbon copy. Narratively finishing just before 6, this one sets up some stuff that still hasn't been answered. Namely what happened to Alex Wesker, and is she really inside Natalia's head? Hopefully Capcom hurry up and get to Revelations 3, or works this into the main series somehow. We need to know what happened to Alex. Number 13. Resident Evil 3 Remake We all know by now that Resident Evil is at its strongest when it leans on survival horror. It's ingrained with the franchise after all. Sure, some of the more action-focused games sell more, but in the long run it's survival horror that keeps this series going. However, with this latest remake, Capcom have kind of struck gold here. Now sure, it's a lot shorter than it should be, and that's why it's not as high on this list. But for the most part, Resident Evil 3 Remake hits the nail on the head, but at the same time is a window into what we could have had. Familiar faces now have a fresh coat of pixels, and Raccoon City looks as how we imagined it back in 1999. And then there's Nemesis, who's more terrifying than ever. Though again, the real problem with this one, it's just too short and we don't get standard Nemesis long enough. That first section where he chases you over a rocket launcher and then flamethrower, just perfect. After that, it just feels like Capcom are just shuffling Jill out the door to finish the game. And speaking of that Jill design, it's just perfect and I can't wait to see it come back in the later game maybe. This might not be the masterpiece that Resident Evil 2 Remake is, and it's missing key parts like the Clock Tower and Gravedigger fight. But at the reduced price it is now, it's certainly worth your time. 
Number 12, Resident Evil. The birthplace of survival horror as we know it, Resident Evil started here in 1996 with just a handful of stars members and a bunch of zombies in a derelict house. Just ask anyone what the scariest video game moment was for years back in the 90s, they would have said the dog jumping through the window. I would have. Resident Evil really took advantage of the PS1 by using pre-rendered backgrounds so they could get the most out of that little machine. We just dread to think what it would have looked like if they tried to go for a full 3D experience. Sadly this one kind of falls to the wayside now with the Resident Evil remake in the early 2000s. Thousands. Though if anything this one will be remembered, and that'll be for the cherry on top, the voice acting. Still holding the Guinness World Record for the worst voice acting in any video game, we'll all remember where the Jill Sandwich was born. That was too close. You were almost a Jill Sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Number 11, Resident Evil Revelations. After the series had taken a turn to be more action orientated, Revelations was a nice jump back into survival horror, sort of. Fans were craving to be scared again and for the first half of this game, they got what they wanted. Revelations was also a saving grace of certain fans. Because after Resident Evil 5, Capcom all but ignored Jill Valentine, so it's nice to play as her once again. Starting life on the Nintendo DS, this was quickly ported to home consoles. And that's safe to say the best way to play it now. Filled with dark corridors and strong enemies, this one stood out against Resident Evil 4 and 5 at the time. And like Revelations 2, slots nicely between games and the canon. Goofy side plots and terrible final boss aside, this one can get really creepy and it's certainly worth a Resident Evil fan's time. Number 10, Resident Evil 5. After Resident Evil 4 caught the industry and well the world by storm, Resident Evil 5 was a given. But long gone were the zombies in Raccoon City, this one went to Africa and saw you pick up Chris Redfield's story, as he's now part of the new BSAA unit fighting BOWs. But missing a certain someone. Yes, Jill is gone in favour of Sheva, but for undisclosed reasons for the most part. Though anyone can probably tell that Jill's the one hiding under that hood. This is where the scares in Resident Evil were all but ditched for action gameplay. Though I will say it's a fun co-op shooter, as long as you play with someone who doesn't waste all their ammo. Playing solo this one just never worked for me personally, and the AI is frankly dumb. What feels like even a further departure from the story really just lends itself to opening Resident Evil up into the wide world. This is partially thanks to the return of Albert Wesker and sewing up the seeds of Umbrella's origins. After Resident Evil 5 the world was Capcom's oyster. It's just a shame they went the way they did with Resident Evil 6. But thankfully we're back in a good place now. Number 9. Resident Evil Zero. Ever wondered what happened before Resident Evil 1? What happened to Bravo Team and why Alpha Team were called out to save them? Well, you're in luck, kids, because Resident Evil Zero has the answers and a little bit more. Before the action romps of 5 and 6, this was arguably the way to have multiple characters in a Resident Evil game. More characters meant more inventory slots and someone to watch your back, but that meant this entry had to be a little tougher. Gone were save room boxes, which meant you had to leave items on the floor, so there was no longer that magic teleporting trick you could use in Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3. Opening on a train filled with zombies, this was the real showpiece of Resident Evil Zero. Though the game was stuck in production limbo for quite a while, as it was meant to come out of the N64 back in the day. Later coming to GameCube and eventually being ported to PS4, Resident Evil Zero still shines today. Rebecca Chambers and Billy Cohen have an uneasy relationship, and it works. And was just something different we had seen up until this point. The game brought back zombies and spiders, but added new enemies, such as the terrible, terrible leech zombies that were a pain to deal with. And then the less said about the broken play crawlers, the better. Though sadly, the bosses in this game are some of the worst of the series. Giant animals are a bit tired now and a bit hokey, but if you finish the game you can unlock the Wesker mode and then be eaten by a giant frog. No! You bitch! Number 8. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. What could possibly make the world of Resident Evil even more scary than it was? How about taking the traumatizing Mr. X sequences from Resident Evil 2 and making an entire game out of it? The team at Capcom thought the third installment of the franchise needed something else to really ramp up survival horror, but with a little bit of an action twist. This one was less about exploring and more about just getting the hell out of Raccoon City, as players once again took up the mantle of Jill Valentine. Taking place before and after 2, Jill was being pursued by the towering tyrant Nemesis, ramping up to a final fight with the titular tyrant and some cool one-liners. You want stars? I'll give you stars. This really was a promising test case for Resident Evil dipping its way into action, though this one wasn't meant to be the third installment, as Capcom had their sights set on Code Veronica, but Sony wanted one last hurrah for their PlayStation 1, and that's what they got. Number 7. Resident Evil Code Veronica X Originally slated to be the third installment of the Resident Evil lineup, Sony stepped in and ordered one more game. Thus Code Veronica was pushed to the side for a bit, but where this one kicks off, the Redfields are after Umbrella. So now Resident Evil is going global and finally leaving Raccoon City behind. The fixed perspective is 
is still here, but this time the camera moves with the player. This is tank control horror at its best. The gameplay was more fluid and fast moving, and accounted for such dreaded monsters like the Banner Snatch, which was designed to attack you off screen. Split into two parts, Rockford Island felt more like the traditional Resident Evil setting, until Claire is taken captive and Chris has to step in. And then we shift over to Antarctica for some John Carpenter The Thing vibes. With Wesker stepping back in, this is where the franchise got a little bit silly, in a good way. I mean, look at him just running around the walls Matrix style. That combined with the Astrid family chewing up the scenery, this one was a perfect stepping stone for Resident Evil to get out of Raccoon City. Now if only Capcom could just remake this one next. Number 6, Resident Evil 7, Biohazard. After Resident Evil 6, we were all exhausted, weren't we? Thankfully, Capcom hit the reset button, sort of. Capcom went right back to the horror roots and put the game in first person. Now feeling more like an Amnesia or PT game for the first half, this was something new and what the fans wanted. Instead of flying Harrier jets and trying to save the world, we were now sneaking around a large estate as the Bakers were trying to get us to join the family. Parts of this felt like Resident Evil meets True Detective, being set in the bayous of America. And with new protagonist Ethan, no one really knew what to make of this at first. Though despite being removed from core Resident Evil, as the game progressed, everything we knew and loved about the series returned. This is the kind of shift Resident Evil needed to be relevant in today's world. And now Resident Evil 7 is the best selling Resident Evil game of all time. So it was clear a success and a blueprint for the franchise going forward. Number 5. Resident Evil 2 This might be the perfect example of a sequel that builds upon the original game in every way. After the cramped confines of the Spencer Mansion, the mere idea of RE2 taken to Raccoon City and the police department was mind blowing. Much of what worked with the original was back, but polished to perfection. We had two new protagonists, Claire Redfield and Leon S. Kennedy. Because Barry Burton was off to his family, Jill was being pursued by a tyrant and Chris was off chasing Umbrella. Claire and Leon have their work cut out for them as well, because zombies up their game in this one, returning in greater numbers. The graphics are overhauled and there's more polygons to play with, just for that extra gory detail. That combined with new monsters, new characters, and government cover-ups, this was a perfect entry into the series. And really from this point in the list, any of these games could be number one, so please don't attack me for having it this low. Number 4. Resident Evil 8 Village now don't worry, I'm going to be light on spoilers for this one. But what I will say is Resident Evil Village makes Resident Evil 7 feel like a beta. And that's not saying Resident Evil 7 is bad. This just improves on it in every single way. The combat is more fleshed out and the enemies more interesting. The Lycans are just straight up more fun to fight than the Molded. More dangerous than the Zombies. And more tactical than the Ganados. And at points that are just so overwhelming, you won't see yourself getting out of this one. The cast of villains this time is more varied. And Chris really stands out here. Ethan's got more personality too. After 25 years of this game, Capcom have proved that Resident Evil is going nowhere. And there's one section in this game which stands out to be one of the most fun in the series. Trust me, you'll love it. But for right now, that's all I'll say about Resident Evil 8. For more info on Resident Evil Village, check out my review. This one stands up with the rest, and I wouldn't fire shade at anyone saying it is the best in the series. Everything from here on out is just stellar. Now excuse me while I go and get stepped on. Number 3. Resident Evil Remake Remakes and remasters are the norm in today's video game industry, but back in 2002, the idea of injecting new life into an old game was still novel. Not even 10 years after its first release, fans were delighted to have the granddaddy of survival horror back, but this was just more than a graphical update. Gone was the wacky voice acting of the past, controls were totally revamped, and the the game was more in line with the new canon. It's magnificent. New areas were added, and even some things moved. And then there was the lore updates. And don't forget the addition of Crimson Heads and Lisa Trevor. Yeah, that's right, Stars members now had to burn these zombies after they put them down, in fear they'd rise again as Crimson Heads. There'll always be a special place in the lineage of Resident Evil for the original. But this remake goes above and beyond to make that game even better, and fit it nicely as the first installment of the entire series. Capcom put the work in, and it's pretty much perfect. Number 2. Resident Evil 2 Remake After years and years of requests and fan anticipation, we finally got a remake of Resident Evil 2. Seriously, since Resident Evil 1 Remake, we wondered what they were doing. Though unlike the Resident Evil 1 Remake, Capcom blended Resident Evil 2 with the stylings of Resident Evil 4. That along with a graphic overhaul and some tweaks to the story, this Resident Evil Remake took us all by storm. Zombies were scary again, and a challenge to fight, and well liquors will make you wait yourself. And then there's Mr X, the big giant stalker that overshadows Nemo. The Raccoon City Police Station is certainly a highlight here, with it almost being identical to the PS1 map. Though after this, the sewers and labs below have been tweaked about a bit to suit the story. This is really a combination of true passion, brilliant design, and the power of the RE engine. Going forward, if Resident Evil jump between third person and first person, I think there's something here for everyone. Number 1. 
Resident Evil 4. It takes a lot of courage to take something that works and rip out almost everything that was recognisable about it and basically start from scratch. Well, just like Capcom did many years later with Resident Evil 7, they first took a leap with the fourth game in the numbered series. Zombies are gone and Raccoon City is nothing but a memory, whilst the Redfields and Wesker are off doing something else. So when the president's daughter is abducted by a weird cult, who else better to save her but Leon S. Kennedy, now no longer a rookie cop. Shinji Mikami didn't just reinvent Resident Evil here, but revolutionised the third person shooter genre. What is now standard with such games being fixed over the shoulder was pretty much a first with Resident Evil. Not only that, but by giving the player the ability to free aim, meant they could target limbs and trip their attackers up, or knock a weapon out of their hand, rather than just firing endlessly and hoping for the dice roll to be in your favour. It can't be said enough that Resident Evil 4 changed the game, for not only the series, but the industry as a whole. And when we look back at it, the fantastic Resident Evil 2 remake really owes its DNA to this. Well done Resident Evil 4, you still hold up. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and that's our list. That's every Resident Evil game ranked from worst to best. What do you think? Do you think I'm totally wrong or do you agree? Let me know down in the comments below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And also let us know what you think of Resident Evil 8. I've been Ben Roy Turner. You can follow me at Ben Roy Turner and follow us all at WCultureGaming. And anyway, until next time, no more games.